Paul, I think, is coming to the meeting. We need to just be running late. Any other apologies? Okay, the draft minutes then of the meeting that was held on the 20th of January. There are pages 4 to 15. And if members are content with their accuracy, uh, then I'll sign them. Content members, yeah. Agreed. Okay. Um, okay, the first item, members, is just uh, to note this particular uh, rule, pages 6 to 34. This rule introduces fees that are charged in the court funds office to users of the services provider uh, with the aim of recovering the running costs of uh, the CFO, the costs have been borne by the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service, but there's a pressure on that budget uh, which is no longer sustainable, and the aim of the proposal is to achieve full cost recovery. The previous committee had considered the SL1. Summary of the consultation response uh, is there on the 21st, on the 21st of June 2016, and it was agreed that it was content with the proposal for the statutory rule. This rule is not subject to assembly proceedings, but the committee is at liberty to scrutinise the rule. Um, that deals with the transferred matter and the department provides the committee with details of the policy relating to the rule. So there's no need for formal agreement on this one. It's just here for noting unless a member wants to raise a particular issue, we could then raise that with the department, but ultimately it's uh, with no jurisdiction to, to stop this rule. So if members are content, we'll note that. Great. Okay. The next agenda items four, five, six, seven, eight and nine, and then there's a similar number later. Uh, is in respect of um, these structures, pages 36 through to 186 of the, the meeting pack. I'm going to invite the officials to come up just to take their place now. Uh, these rules increase the fees that are charged for the, the delivery of civil and family court business. It updates the qualifying benefits for the purposes of exemptions from fees to recognise universal credit as a qualifying benefit. The, the increase in the fees have been in effect, came into effect on the 1st of April 2017 when there was an increase of 10% applied. This was followed by a further increase of 7.5% on the 1st of April 2018 and then another increase of 5% on the 1st of April 2019. Uh, the, there is another 5% increase in fees from the 1st of October 2019 and there the statutory rules of items 11 through to 16. So the same areas to discuss will be applicable to those statutory rules when we get to them uh, in the uh, agenda. Um, I thought it would be helpful just to have officials here. Just to give a, a general overview, Peter, you're welcome. Um, uh, I'll let you introduce your team in due course. but. This is just, without going through each particular statutory rule, um, I don't think that's necessary, um, but we wanted just to, to get a flavour of uh, why it's been necessary in terms of the increases in these fees, the phased approach to get to the, the full recovery position that uh, the Department has wanted to pursue. Members, there is a Hansard transcript of the previous Justice Committee having a discussion around this in your meeting pack as well, um, but I just thought it would be helpful. Uh, Peter, if you were able to introduce your team and then give us a flavour of um, how we've got to where we've got to by way of these increases over the last three years. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so I'm Peter Looney. I'm the Chief Executive of the Courts and Tribunal Service, and, and with me today is Louise Laverty, who is our Director of Finance, Joanne Hendry, who heads up the Civil Fee Team, and Richard Ronaldson is Head of Court Funds. Um, as you said, uh, we've been before the committee previously to discuss the, the, the whole programme of civil fee increases, and, and at that time my predecessor, Ronnie Armour, outlined how we found ourselves in the opening position, which was we, we reviewed our fee recovery position in 2015 uh, and determined that we were only recovering at, at just over 70% uh, of, of the, the cost of running the, the uh, civil and family business. Um, as a result of that, it was necessary then, in accordance with the Managing Public Money Guidelines, to take steps to see how we could achieve a greater balance uh, in, in that area. That means taking a, a serious look at the, the cost side of the equation to make sure that we can uh, drive down costs uh, and make sure that we're delivering the business as effectively as possible. 
uh, and a lot of work has been done around that. Um, and again, we, we have reduced headcount. Uh, there was uh, over 70 posts taken out of the court service. Uh, we gave up a lot of leased accommodation, uh, particularly around the city centre, and moved business areas into owned accommodation. Uh, and we also took a very uh, serious look at our contracts uh, and tried to drive efficiencies out of those. Uh, and overall, we, we managed to reduce the cost side by uh, around four and a half million. Uh, that's, that doesn't mean that that work is done and dusted. We, we continue to keep that under review. We continue to look, to look very carefully at the costs that are being apportioned to, to civil business uh, and make sure that we are, we are doing it as efficiently as possible. Um, we uh, have a number of initiatives have uh, taken place. We have uh, introduced a, a new line of business system in the court funds office, which allowed us to achieve headcount savings. Uh, also, in conjunction with the judiciary, we have introduced things like the civil hearing centre, which is a way of brigading civil business together uh, and hopefully deal with it more effectively. Uh, that has been piloted in the RMI area and we hope will be rolled out to other areas uh, in the, the incoming year. So again, we're, we're looking to see that we're, we're uh, achieving or put, putting the business through the system as, as effectively as, as we can within the, the, the current framework. Mm -hmm. However, it was necessary to look at fee increases, and as a result of that, we brought forward the, the first phase of the proposals, which was the, the three-year phased increase, uh, and that was discussed with the committee in, in 2016 uh, and was legislated for in the, the uh, instruments that you have before you today. Um, that was... Uh, an initial step uh, in, in the, the work. We, we did say at that stage that this would be an ongoing programme of work and that rather than just taking that salami slice approach to across the board increases, we would also want to look at specific business areas to see were we charging for all the business that was, was, that was being done, were there parts of the business where perhaps we were uh, carrying out administrative tasks which weren't being um, uh, charged for. Uh, and that that would all be brought forward as part of, of further, uh, further future phases. Uh, the first phase of the increase was uh, implemented and it, it has had a very positive impact on the, the income. Um, we did say that at that stage that we hoped that the fee increases uh, would raise about four and a half million pounds. Um, and I think our current forecast is that we will have generated an, an additional three and a half million pounds. Mm -hmm. um, the reason for that shortfall uh, some of that is coming from the magistrates' courts where income has fallen, um, and most of the fee earning business that goes through magistrates', magistrates courts tends to be the likes of land and property services or housing executive uh, debt processes. Um, and I know that LPS have uh, started to do more pursuit of debt in house before they go down the, the court route. So that may have uh, an explanation of some of the, the reduction in business in, on that sphere. Um, but by and large, we, we, we believe that the, the fee increases have achieved what it was we, we hoped that they would achieve. Um, the second phase of the, the proposed increases then was brought forward, and that was, again, looking at re reviewing the cost recovery model to see what progress we had made uh, and deciding how best to take forward the next stage. Um, at that stage, we had uh, increased our fee recovery rate to around 80 per cent, um, and that Perhaps it wasn't as much as we would have hoped, um, but again, we, we recognise that the, the cost of doing civil and family business isn't a steady thing. Every, every year we have inflationary costs being built onto that. The, the agency uh, has inflationary costs of a million pounds per annum, uh, a proportion of which will sit on civil and family business. Um, so you can see that from 2016, we have had that inflationary increase uh, each year uh, as we have gone along, uh, and that needs to be built into the model. Um, we have also looked, uh, we've, we've had some unexpected increases as well. I mean, there was, there was a, a fairly substantial increase as a result of changes around pension contributions, which again wasn't, um, wasn't anticipated, uh, and that was a, a £2 million pounds increase. I, again, a proportion of that would have sat on, on the, the civil and fee uh, earning business. Mm -hmm. um, but we have tried to, to manage that as, as, as uh, efficiently as possible, um, and through the, the second phase of the increases, uh, we went out and we consulted not just on uh, an additional increase across the board, but we, we drilled into areas where we thought perhaps the fee structure didn't reflect the business that was being done. 
um, and that was primarily around the enforcement of judgments offices. Uh, we, we saw that there was um, a, a misalignment of the fees for using public search registries compared to all the other areas of, of business that, that we, we have search facilities for, uh, and we wanted to align those. Um, and we also looked uh, in the High Court in particular because as a result of changes to judicial practice and practice directions, uh, there were fees which were previously in existence and previously charged for uh, uh, listing cases for hearing, which were no, nor no longer being charged because the practice direction resulted in that being done automatically. So again, we needed to, we, we were still doing all the administration that was associated with that, but we weren't generating the fee income. Um, so we took positive steps to try and restructure uh, the fees to make sure that we were charging for that business going forward. Um, and that, those were the instruments that were then signed uh, in, uh, and came into force in October uh, 19. Um, we are waiting to see the, the full impact of, of those. Um, and again, I'm happy to keep the, the, the committee informed of how that impacts on the, the fee recovery position. Yeah, and was that in, in October? I was just one of my queries because obviously the previous set of fees look to be following the financial calendar year, and then there's been this one. You had one in, in April 2019, six months later, one came in first of October. What, what, was that down to the review of practice directions, or, or why was that? I think forward? it was. It was down to the the engagement and the consultation um, being a lot more intensive than than we had expected at the outset. Um, we recognised the impact that, that fees would have, particularly on, on some specific sectors. The, the law searchers in particular tend to be um, relatively small businesses, uh, and we wanted to take time to engage with them and to engage with the law society to, to really understand the, the impact that the, the increases would have. Um, whenever we consulted, we had uh, indicated that our intention was that the fee increases would come in at the, the, in April 19, again, to, to run for the full year. But because we took longer over the, the consultation and engagement, and, and I think it was really yeah. worthwhile doing that because it modified the, the, the proposals, mm -hmm. um, we, we then ended up bringing them forward mid-year. Okay. Um, so if, if you've been able to drive efficiencies of um, about four and a half million pounds then from you first started this process back in 2016, um, you've made the point that there was a, an unanticipated two million pounds for pension contributions, and then you've had other issues you know, to do with inflationary costs. I suppose it's it's where you started this at a cost recovery basis, and if that was at 70% then, and you've drove out four and a half million pound of efficiency, you've now generated a, additional income of three and a half million pounds. Um, at what point are you going to get the cost, that full cost recovery? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure we will. I, I think, again, we need to recognise that, that fees, fees need to be, our fee increases need to be proportionate. I, I think to, to achieve full cost recovery in this field, particularly given the, the work which will be taken forward around modernisation, um, I, I think that, that we need to be realistic about what the cost recovery position will ultimately look like. Equally, I think that um, the, the fees that we charge for lodging business are only one small part of, of the process that, that uh, a citizen would, would face whenever they, they bring proceedings to court. Their costs are, are tied up in, in their legal costs, they're tied up in their, their, their time, their opportunity costs for, for attending court. Um, and through, through the modernisation programme, we really want to try and look at the overall journey that, that people have as, as they, they come to court. Some of the modernisation initiatives that we will bring forward and, and have looked at will drive down the cost of administration, and, and that should again be reflected in, in the cost model. Um, but some of them actually will increase the, the, the cost of, of transacting um, civil and family business from our side, and, and from that side will drive up the cost model. And, and there I'm thinking about things like uh, if we invest a significant amount of capital in either buildings or new IT line of business systems to support a more innovative way of working, well, that needs to be uh, built into the equation and, and defrayed across the, the useful life of that asset. Um, equally, if there, there, I, th I, I expect that there will be a focus around not bringing cases to court unnecessarily. I mean, there, there is a large focus around mediation and alter alternative dispute resolution for uh, suitable cases. Um, and if, for example, we, we take a, a proportion of um, small claims or small debt business out of the courts and deal with it by way of mediation. 
but then our fixed overheads are still what they are. The, 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 the cost of maintaining the buildings are still there. Uh, the cost of the line of business systems are still there. Staffing might reduce because we've taken some, some um, business out. But overall, the, the, the cost per case, again, might increase. So modernization, I don't think, is a panacea to suddenly reducing all our costs. I think uh, there will be pros and cons with it. But what I do think modernization will do will be to improve the overall uh, experience of, of people and, and maybe get away from this situation where people have to come to court six, seven, eight times until their case is dealt with. Okay. Um, and finally then, in terms of the £3.5 million pounds increased income, how much of that is funded through additional pressure on the legal aid budget? Um, yes, we, we looked at that. The total cost to the legal aid fund from all the phases of the, the increases together, mm -hmm. uh, I think, is estimated at about half a million. Okay. Um, now, that's obviously to be set in the context of, of, of an overall budget of £44 million, um, okay. but, but yes, about half a million would be attributable to legal aid. Okay, um, okay members. I know Peter is going to be here on Thursday, yes. so we're going to have a much more in-depth conversation about modernisation and the court service, so this is just specifically to deal with those fees. I just felt it was important to cover some of the ground that the previous committee had discussed on this. Uh, I have no issue with the, the proposals that are in front of me to go through, but I felt for context purposes it would be helpful. So if there's questions specifically around these fees as opposed to broader issues that we can ask Peter on Thursday. I'm happy for members to do that. Yes, Linda. Just one quick question. I have loads of questions, but, the, but I'll leave them to Thursday. Um, just in relation then to, to access to just access to, to the courts, has this led to any negative impact that you're aware of in terms of people wanting to access? Um, not not that we're aware of. Um, we, I, again, we were mindful of the, the impact that fee increases could have on people where uh, maybe they, they have low income or, or low disposable income. Uh, and from that point of view, we, we took steps to try and promote the remissions and exemptions policy. Uh, we developed new booklets which were available in court offices, advertised it on, on, on the, the, the court service website, and, and we also uh, made sure that when staff were dealing with individuals that they, they highlighted the, the availability of the policy. Um, overall, the number of, of people that use that has remained reasonably static, uh, but we have sought to promote that uh, in recognition of that specific issue that you raise. Okay. Gordon. Thanks, sir. Thanks very much. Um, what initiated the programme back in 2016, was it? Uh, I think it was the, the review of the, the, the fee recovery position. Um, I, I remember um, prior to that, uh, repeatedly seeing papers which would have said that our, our cost recovery position was about 104 yes. percent um, and, and uh, probably sat and, and clapped ourselves in the back and thought that was that was good um, now the the regime that we operated under then was one that was set by treasury and i think just with the the passage of time uh, and and uh, the devolution i think that the various elements that go into the cost recovery uh, formula had changed and i think in particular uh, the way in which um, the dilapidations were, were calculated uh, and the cost of capital had changed substantially. Uh, <coughs> whenever we actually sat back and took time to look at it uh, again and to make sure that it was being calculated properly, we discovered that that was a, a fairly substantial impact, uh, which, which then reduced, took us away from where we thought we were, which was 104%, and brought us down to just over 70%. Um, and that's really what, what started it all. And it's going to be it's going to continue as an ongoing process, yeah? Sorry? Is this going to continue as an ongoing process? Yes, I think what ideally what we would like to be able to do is to, to get to a position where we had um, regular reviews of the, the fees that are charged um, to, to at least make sure that they're, they're keeping pace with inflation, uh, to, to offset those. Uh, in addition to that, I think that we need to continue to review structurally how the fees are, to again take account of how uh, the way in which business is transacted has changed, uh, to make sure that we're also building those in. So, so if, for example, um, a proportion of business comes out of the High Court and, and moves into the County Court, that's going to impact on, on the, the, the fee recovery position, so how do we respond to that? Um, if as, as a result of changes being brought forward by the, the department or by ourselves, we suddenly see a lot more mediation being used in civil or family cases. Again, that has the potential to structurally impact on the type of business that's going through. So, so yes, I think 
I think rather than find ourselves in a position where we hadn't increased fees from 2007 to 2016, uh, which, which yeah. I don't think we could allow it to happen again, I think we need to have regular reviews which both look at inflation and look at structural changes. Yeah. You've covered about three million pounds, or clawed back three million. Yeah. Where does that come from? Would that be from the public, or is that from government agencies or large customers? That um, use the court. I don't know if we have a specific breakdown in that. I mean, I, I do know that that we we have a, a mix of both. Obviously, the fa family proceedings would primarily be individuals. Um, in the civil courts, we would get a lot more uh, bulk customers, both uh, the likes of housing executive, land and property yeah, services. Yeah. Um, I, I can, I can, I'll take that away and see whether we can give you a more meaningful breakdown of that. Um, and, and if I can, I'll update you on Thursday. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Rachel Woods. Thank you. Um, just two brief questions, one following on from Gordon's point there in terms of um, an ongoing process. Are you expecting any further increases in the next financial year? In the next financial year, I, I don't think we'd do anything in the incoming financial year. Jo Joanne and our team are continuing to look at the, the, the whole area of fee recovery, but I wouldn't anticipate bringing anything forward that quickly. Okay. Well, there's the EJO search fee, which oh, was what, which provided is for it's in, in, in the yeah. 19 instrument. Yeah. It's to be implemented in... Yes. As, as, a, as a result of the engagement that we had with the law searches in particular, we agreed that we would introduce the, the search fees uh, increase in over a couple of years, but that's already provided for in the instrument okay. that you have. So there will be no additional percentage increase then in this next financial year? Okay. Um, and then just to clarify, with the addition of universal credit as a benefit, qualifying benefit within this, um, I take it that's an addition and there's no one on the legacy benefits are being removed from any of the, let's, you know, that, that's all just add it and I get that additional one? It is. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, <coughs> Patsy? Yep. Thanks, Chair. Sorry. Just I'm intrigued by the concept. Did you say 104% cost recovery? It, it was. That, that's what they... they Sorry, I'm intrigued by... Uh, to me, baseline would be 100% cost recovery. Yep. Where does the 4% come from then? I'm, I'm intrigued by that notion. Maybe I'm. That's a, that's a long time ago. I, that's, uh, I, I, I remember the figure being available, but I, I, I don't have detail on, on why. Well, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to establish just the concept. If your cost, well, the, the, the concept cost was 100%. Yeah, well, whenever it was basically whenever whenever you took the cost, as as we understood it then, of, of administering civil and family business, and then offset it against the fees. We were actually bringing in too much fee income at that point, right. so it was just slightly mm -hmm. more. So it was beyond should. cost recovery. It was we, over, we were beyond. Over cost. Ah, right, okay, yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if that you. was ever replicated, it would need to have a reduction in fees. It would. You know, if, if that was something that was going to be a sustained position, you would then, I would like to think, reduce the fees and. and we would. I mean, we we would have to make sure that we weren't uh, consistently. I don't think we will for some time. Yes, we'd have to make sure that we weren't consistently over recovering. In fact, uh, when uh, HMCTS uh, in London brought forward their modernisation programme, they had to get oh. specific statutory authority to allow them to over recover so that they could invest in their their modernisation programme. Okay. They they wouldn't have been allowed to do it without that statutory cover. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think that's everyone content. Um, Peter, thank you and your team. And, you, um, we shall see you on Thursday. Yeah. Okay, members, so the, these, these set of statutory rules, again, they're not subject to the Assembly proceedings, but the committee can scrutinise them. Um, the previous committee considered the proposed rules following oral evidence sessions uh, with the court service officials on the results of the public consultation. Um, and on the 24th of November 2016, it did agree that it was content with the proposal. So the rules then came into operation on the 1st of April 2017. So I just need to go through each of them individually, but they are for noting. Okay, so if members are content to note, SR 2017 forward slash 11, the Court of Judicature, uh, non contentious probate fees amendment order Northern Ireland 2017, noted. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Um, Members are content to note SR 2017 forward slash 12, the Judgment Enforcement Fees <coughs> Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2017. Noted? Noted. Yep. Members are content to note SR 2017 forward slash 14, the Magistrate Courts Fees Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2017. Noted? Noted. Noted. Members are content to note SR 2017 forward slash 15, the County Court Fees Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2017. Noted? Right. Mm. Members are content to note SR 2017 forward slash 16, the Court of Judicature Fees Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2017. 
Noted. Noted. Members are content to note SR 2017 forward slash 17, the Court of Judicature Fees Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2017. Noted. Item 12 is the Magistrate Court Fees, 188 to, uh, 88 to 196. Um, this statutory rule is one of a number uh, that are introduced to support the commencement of Part 1 of the Justice Act, Northern, uh, Northern Ireland 2016. It makes new provision in relation to the enforcement of fines and other penalties. It amends the Magistrate Court Fees Order of Northern Ireland 96, so that no fee is payable for an application by an employer for a determination on what may constitute earnings for the purposes of an attachment of earnings order in relation to a debtor. Um, the rule is not subject to assembly proceedings, um, but again, as like the other ones, the committee can't scrutinise it, um, but it is for noting and the rule came into operation on the 1st of June 2018. So unless members have any issues to raise, I'll put the question for noting. Um, Members are content to note SR 2018 forward slash 101, the Magistrate Courts Fees Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2018. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, members, the, the next set of statutory rules all relate to the presentation from Peter and his team. This is to do with a 5% uh, increase that came in on the 1st of October 2019. So, again, I need to go through them all um, with the same procedure as last time. Um, the rules also introduce changes to the existing exemptions and remission policy so that the policy does not apply to photocopy and copy documents and search fees. Um, the court service will also continue to partially subsidise children and family cases and fully subsidise cases relating to domestic violence. Um, so that applies to the next five statutory rules. And I will now move to go through them all. If members are content to note SR 2019 forward slash 175, the Court of Judicature non contentious probate fees amendment order in Northern Ireland 2019. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next one's 228 to 262. Uh, this is to do with a 5% increase, um, and it also relates to the fee for searches of the Register of Judgments. They'll be increased so as to align this to the search fee charges in other areas of the court service business. Uh, and again, it's for noting members, so I put the question that members are content to note. SR 2019 forward slash 176, the Judgment and Forces Fees Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2019. Great. Great. Next one, um, again, uh, relates to the introducing a fee for the certification by a court officer of the forms required to register a pending action in relation to land in the land registry and introduces changes to the existing exemptions and remission policy so that it doesn't apply to the photocopying a copy of documents, inspections, searches, certificates that are a result of the search fee. Uh, again, it's not subject to any assembly proceedings, but we can't scrutinise it, so it's here for noting, and I'll put the question that... Uh, members uh, are content to note SR 2019 forward slash 177, the County Court Fees Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2019. Agreed. Agreed. The uh, next item is 5% increase in fees charged for the delivery of family business in respect of family proceedings. It also introduces changes to the existing exemption and remission policy, so it doesn't apply to photocopy and copy documents and search fees. Not subject to any assembly proceedings, but it's here for noting, so I put the question to members that you're content to note. SR 2019 forward slash 178, the Family Proceedings Fees Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2019. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Um, next item is the implementation again, a 5% increase to fees charged for delivery of civil and family business in magistrate courts from 1st of October uh, 2019 and also introduces the existing exemptions and remission policies as I previously mentioned before in respect to photocopying documents and search fees. Not subject to assembly proceedings but it's here for noting so I put the question members are content uh, to note SR 2019 forward slash 179 the magistrate courts fees amendment order Northern Ireland 2019. Agreed? Right. Um, next rule, uh, again, relates to specific changes around the introduction of case management review hearing fees for a review hearing before the High Court Master and for a review hearing before a High Court Judge. 
an increase in the fee for an application to transfer an action to the commercial list and the introduction of a fee for the certification by a court officer of the forms required to register a pending action in relation to land and land registry and changes to the existing exemptions and remission policy. So it's not subject to assembly proceedings and I'll put it to members for noting if you're content to note SR 2019 forward slash 180, the Court of Judicature Fees Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2019. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, members. Um, next item then is not about fees, um, it's the Judicial Pensions Regulations, um, pages 428 to 438. We had covered a similar rule at the previous meeting of the committee, and this is around the Judicial Pension Regulations. 2015 to put further interim arrangements in place for the setting of members' contributions at the uh, existing contribution rates and earnings thresholds beyond the 31st of March 2020. Uh, failure to make these provisions in the 2015 regulations will have an adverse effect or impact on the effective operation of the scheme, and there will be no statutory basis for setting or collecting member contributions, which would have an adverse impact on members as they would not be able to accrue the benefits under the Northern Ireland Judicial pension scheme. It is subject to uh, negative resolution. Uh, the Assembly procedure for making amending regulations uh, to the Judicial Pension Regulations would ordinarily be through draft affirmative procedure. However, uh, Public Services Pensions um, 2014, under which these regulations are made, allows for negative procedure if the Pension Board for that scheme has stated that the regulations are minor or wholly beneficial. The uh, Northern Ireland Judicial Pension Scheme Board has confirmed that it's content that these amendments are indeed minor or wholly beneficial. So, as a result, the Department tends to make these amending regulations for the extension of member contribution rates and earning thresholds for one year by the negative resolution procedure. Um, and so, it's uh, for members now to agree subject to the findings of the examiner's statutory rules report. And I should any further information members, I will put the question formally that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2020 forward slash 10, the Judicial Pensions Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Item 18, pages 440 to 450 of your meeting folder. This rule makes a minor technical amendment to county court rules of the Northern Ireland 1981 um, clarifies when a fee is payable to a lawyer for preparing court-directed skeleton uh, arguments. The rule is subject to negative resolution. Um, it comes into operation uh, on the 2nd of March this year. Uh, the examiner for statutory rules will report our findings on the technical elements of the rule in the near future. Normally, the committee wouldn't consider um, this rule until that report. However, um, the statutory time period within the committee can scrutinise this rule is limited and therefore it has to be dealt with uh, today. So unless members have any further clarity on this, I'll put the question formally in respect of this statutory rule that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2020 forward slash 11, the County Court Amendment Rules Northern Ireland 2020 and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Police Service Regulations, pages 452 to 459, and also 30 to 31 in your table pack. The statutory rule amends the definition of the first bank holiday in May 2020 in relation to the Police Service of Northern Ireland Regulations 2005 and the Police Service of Northern Ireland Reserve Injury Benefit Regulations 2006. This amendment is necessary to reflect the decision by the UK Government to move the first bank holiday in May 2020 from Monday the 4th of May to Friday the 8th of May, uh, which is to coincide with the commemorations of the 75th anniversary of uh, Victory in Europe Day, and it's intended to support uh, the PSNI operational planning uh, by allowing it to prepare the correct rostering of shifts and application of correct salary payments. So an interesting statutory rule that's required. So it's subject to negative resolution, um, so I will put it uh, to members. Ten. The Committee for Justice considered SR 2020 forward slash 13, the Police Service of Northern Ireland Amendment Regulations 2020, uh, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Members agreed? Agreed. 
Okay, the next item 20, uh, this commencement order brings into force provisions in the Policing and Crime Act 2017 in respect to disregards and pardons, uh, including posthumous pardons for specific offences. Uh, the rule is, subject to, uh, is not subject to assembly proceedings, so it's for noting. Um, if members are content, then I will ask members to note SR 2018 forward slash 128, the Policing Crime Act 2017 Order 2018. Noted. Noted. Agreed. Um, again, this uh, section, just pages 465 to 468, in terms of the uh, Justice uh, Order 2018, uh, the commencement order brings in brings sections 1 to 32. Uh, into operation together with schedules 1 and 2 where they are not already in operation on the 1st of June 2018. Part 1 of the 2016 Act makes new provision in relation to the enforcement of fines and other penalties. Schedule 1 makes further provision in relation to the attachment of earnings orders and Schedule 2 makes minor and consequential amendments uh, in uh, the consequences of Part 1. Uh, again, this, is, this rule isn't subject to assembly proceedings, so it's here, members, for noting, um, but it is open to scrutiny and we can correspond with the department if necessary. Um, if there's no further information required, then I'll ask members to note SR 2018 forward slash 99, uh, the Justice Order 2018. Noted. Ready. Item 22, Crown Court Rules, pages 470 to 482. This uh, rule seeks to simplify existing mutual legal assistance measures for requesting and sharing evidence for criminal investigations between participating states. The key elements include standardising the format in which a request is made, applying the principle of mutual recognition to requests and introducing timeframes for responding to requests. The rule provides for applications for a European investigation order to be made to a Crown Court in Northern Ireland seeking, seeking assistance from other participating states in obtaining evidence from uh, for criminal investigations. Such evidence can then be used in Northern Ireland criminal investigations and proceedings. The rule also provides for judicial consideration in Northern Ireland of a European investigation order made in another participating state for execution in Northern Ireland. The rules were drafted by in Northern Ireland by the Office of the Lord Chief Justice and were agreed and made by the Northern Ireland Crown Court Rules Committee. After making Crown Court Rules, the Crown Court Rules Committee then submit them to the relevant authority. In relation to Crown Court Rules which deal with an expected matter, uh, the relevant authority is the Lord Chancellor um, as the European Investigation Order is considered an accepted matter. Uh, the rules were submitted then to the Lord Chancellor. The 2017 regulations provide that the rules of court may make provision as to the practice and procedure to be followed in connection with proceedings under the regulations. This provides the varies to make court rules in Northern Ireland where functions are conferred on a judicial authority. Um, this is the first time that this provision has been used. Um, the statutory rule was laid in Westminster Parliament on the 1st of February 2018 through the negative resolution procedure and they are not subject to assembly proceedings. Okay, member, so it's just here for noting. Um, so I'll ask members to note that SR 2018 forward slash 24, the Crown Court Amendment Rules Northern Ireland 2018. Noted. Great. Um, next item, page 484 to 492. This rule is similar to the provision uh, to the previous one, uh, but provides for these applications in the magistrate courts, and it was laid in Parliament on the 1st of February 2018, again through the negative resolution procedure, and isn't subject to... Uh, this Assembly's proceedings. So, again, members, if I can ask uh, that the committee noted SR 2018 forward slash 25, the Magistrates Court Amendment Rules, Northern Ireland 2018. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, members, um, we have one more, I think, statutory instrument uh, on Thursday, yeah. and that will be the committee up to date by way of the statutory rules. Um, so, we will conclude that item. Um, in two days' time, but that concludes the business for today. Our next meeting is at two o'clock again in this room on Thursday. Okay, I'll adjourn the meeting. Adjourn. 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.